<clears throat> so, Zach Parker quits after four rounds of action against John Ryder. Well, let's just get into the fight real quickly. I'm not going to have any more of a preview. The first four rounds, or at least the way the four rounds went, it was a pretty touch-and-go type of a fight. Uh, John Ryder was kind of circumspect the way I thought he would be and the way he kind of was against John Ryder. Uh, Zach Parker did some things right. Uh, he was picking his jab you know, nicely. He was active with it, a little bit more active than I expected it to be, but he was using it well and he wasn't getting into necessarily appalling sort of a fencing type of a type of a battle with John Ryder in the pocket. Uh, but I do think one thing he did wrong and one thing that I feel like cost him and allowed John Ryder to have a lot more success with his jab than he could have, you know, more success than he probably should have had was the fact that he spent too much time in the southpaw stance. In the orthodox stance, where obviously he, his, uh, his head is going to be further away from his as opposed to if his you know, lead foot is his right foot, you know, against Southpaw, again, in, you know, John Ryder. Uh, he was effectively able to allow John Ryder to establish his jab quite a bit, and he started to land it in the second and third rounds. I won't necessarily say with regularity, but in some pretty good episodes, in some good spurts. Uh, Parker, though, was landing the more eye-catching, more telling shots. Ryder would have good moments where he was able to back uh, Parker against the ropes, and even though they were effective in the sense that they were kind of wearing Parker down, Parker was having to expend quite a bit of energy trying to clinch him, and Parker was definitely kind of fearful on the inside. He seemed a bit surprised at the physical strength that, you know, John Ryder had been able to exhibit. He was still able to, you know, deflect and roll many of the shots, and he was able to stop Ryder from really landing scoring shots, and he was picking some nice rights to the body, especially. Some good right hands over the top period that he was using, you know, the, the angles. But he did hurt actually, actually hurt John Ryder with a right to the body in round two. But then came round four, and it was basically like a continuation of the work that John Ryder was able to surmount in the previous few rounds. And let's be honest, Zach Parker, whether he broke his hand or not, uh, I, won't, I wouldn't be surprised if he did or he didn't. Nevertheless, I was rather disappointed in the fact that he quit. Um, obviously, I'm not in his position, but at the same time, with what's at stake, a title eliminator to potentially earn you the biggest payday of your life against Canelo and what would be the biggest fight of his career, more than likely, period, you know, no matter who really comes through the ranks and potentially challenges him that's going to be the biggest contest of his career the biggest payday he'll ever received and ultimately his breakout fight should he t or should he have been able to supersede a john Ryder and been able to fight him with what's at stake the fact that he quit knowing the precedence of fighters who have been able to continue with you know broken hands or separated shoulders you know people like you know gary russell even though he lost to Mark Magsayo, he was able to continue and keep the fight close. And not only that, but with the fact that Zach Parker is a switch hitter himself, uh, the fact that he's able, you know, he's been able to, he's able to alternate between stances and, you know, depending on which stance he's in, he can throw, you know, straight left hands, he can throw left jabs out of the orthodox stance. Uh, he can set up left uppercuts out of both stances. He can throw left hooks out of the orthodox stance, or even really just, you know, left crosses. He does have a large punch arsenal still available to him with the fact that he can switch depending on the type of shots he's trying to execute. And he does like to switch quite a bit in the pocket, and he does shift on the inside when he actually does fight inside. So the fact that he wasn't willing to... Uh, that, that he wasn't willing to at least fight on even a little bit after his hand supposedly got hurt, that definitely did kind of uh, disillusion me. I mean, to some extent, I kind of feel like he looked for a way out, and I do think Ryder's pressure was actually starting to take its toll. It was forcing Parker to exert himself quite a bit, even though you know, Ryder's pressure wasn't necessarily even overt. He was just taking very small ste steps and kind of plodding his way in. He was forcing Parker to expend a lot of energy, and 
maybe that got to him, to be honest. Maybe it was a combination of both. Uh, nevertheless, he looked for a way out, and at the end of four rounds, he pulled out with a hand injury. So, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. I thought, you know, say it was a real injury. That's disappointing, too, because, I mean, if he hadn't gotten injured, this would have been a very competitive fight. It could have gone the distance, or maybe we would have seen him eventually fall down the stretch, and John Ryder would have been able to maybe pull something off. Maybe been able to stop him late, break him down, or maybe we would have seen Zach Parker start to dig you know, deeper into his bag of tricks as Ryder progressively closes the distance, and he starts to lose you know, what he has left in terms of his gas tank. That's assuming his right-hand injury was... Uh, legitimate or as you know the severity of it was to the degree that was as exacerbated to the degree that you know Zach and his team seemed to make out but yeah I'm disappointed I'm very very disappointed I and the disown card uh, it wasn't that much better Obviously, I got my pick wrong in that instance. However, I did redeem myself to some extent, I suppose, with the Wardley-Gorman fight. Uh, I was confused by the bookmakers, you know, listing it as a 50-50 fight. Um, I felt as though... Nathan Gorman, who himself pretty much lacks any types of a type of fighting intangibles he has i suppose you know genetically with the fact that he's you know related to the furies he's you know a cousin of tyson i suppose he does have that sort of you know twitchiness and the speed you know the fact that he can show up to the fights in such you know deplorable condition and pretty much with the same you know physical appearance as a marshmallow the fact that he's still able to retain you know a certain level of athleticism and speed but apart from that he really doesn't have great heart. He doesn't have a great chin. He doesn't have significant power. Uh, he's not even bothered. The sport clearly does not galvanize him enough to where he can, you know, sit in the gym and really whip himself into shape despite the fact that he does actually have somewhat of a decent frame for a heavyweight. Ah, uh, yeah, they're just, just to be expected, you know, with him. And Wardley certainly isn't the most talented fighter. He, you know, decent hand speed, decent power, but, you know, Wardley isn't someone who is the biggest heavyweight. He himself doesn't have the greatest of chins. He's been hurt before by guys like Molina. Uh, he even got momentarily buzzed early in his fight with Nick Webb. He does have power, and he does actually work hard at his trade. He actually does have experience. He has sparred the likes of Joshua, Dillian White, of course. He's, you know, sparred, I think, Dubois as well. He has a lot of experience in the gym with many of these fighters, and he himself has proven his ability to come through adversity. He clearly does have heart and a desire and a will to win uh, that Nathan Gorman clearly does not have. He's willing to go to extents that Gorman clearly can't. Uh, Gorman hurt him in early, early in round two, and he kind of took his eye off the ball, I suppose. Uh, his neuroreceptors, you know, his desire for dopamine due to what, you know, type of topping he wants on his next kebab sort of overtook his focus, and he proceeded to get his ass whooped, and his corner eventually toweled him. I thought it was soft at first, but at the same time, now that I kind of think about it, um... Yeah, I mean, I, not like it was going to go much different anyways, because Gorman hasn't necessarily shown a propensity to be able to overcome adversity, you know. And then we have the main event to the card. Dillian White versus the American Jermaine Franklin. Dillian White looks shot. Uh, it looks slow. Not that Dillian White's ever been particularly quick, but, you know, even his whipping left hooks look rather slow. He looked so much more reliant in his, you know, upper body shifts and mechanics. His hand speed is clearly depleted. His punch resistance has too depleted. He was hurt in the first and seventh rounds uh, with right hands to the temple. He was basically put on wobbly legs at the end of the seventh to where he was forced to hold on. Franklin is another guy who I suppose, like Gorman, is not really in any type of good condition. Especially in this fight, he did not show up at an adequate weight. He was 257 in a fight where he should have been somewhere between 235 and 245. But 
he did look improved in this fight, to be honest. He showed good combination punching, you know, a decent ability to fight at range, an okay jab, uh, some good body work, actually, too, and decent inside ability. Dillian, uh, Buddy McGirt was incompetent in his corner, giving him some of the most misguided instructions I think I've ever seen him give a fighter. He was telling Dillian basically to box at range. He says he had never seen White before, and it was pretty evident. Um, White was having the best of his success on the inside, where he was able to push uh, Jermaine Franklin back. He clearly, White is clearly better at shortening his punches up than Franklin. Well, I won't necessarily say shortening his punches up, but he's able to get off some good hooks up close at least. He does get, you know, a lot of torque into those shots on the inside, but he's definitely better at doing that while simultaneously getting power into his shots than Franklin. But with the fact that um, McGirt effectively wanted him to fight a rather jab-heavy fight, which White didn't do, he wanted him to supposedly use a shoulder roll, uh, that was not effective because he was just getting picked off at long range. He didn't have the hand speed to be able to catch and pick, you know, he didn't have the hand speed to be able to pick Jermaine Franklin off at long range without getting hit at least two or three times more, you know, than what he was able to deliver himself. And Franklin also showed a great chin. Franklin really did show some decent ability, but he just needs to get into shape. If he got into shape, if he lowered himself down to around 235 to 240, you know, a decent musculature. He even showed decent enough conditioning in this fight. If he's able to get himself in shape... Or if he were even in shape for this fight, he would have pretty comfortably won and maybe even stopped White. Um, but he just needs to he needs to get into shape, and he could be competitive with some top twenty heavyweights. Uh, I think, even though he is unfortunate, he was unfortunate not to get to the, the decision. This certainly legitimized him to some extent, to a degree, uh, and this will get him another opportunity as some type of a gateway opponent. Maybe him versus Otto Wallin, that'd be a decent fight. Uh, him versus some type of prospect, maybe a Bakudir Jalalov. There's some good fights out there for him, and he's going to get another opportunity off of this, and I'm pretty sure he was probably paid relatively handsomely for this fight, and he'll get another shot. I thought he won the fight too, but that's matchroom. Dillian White goes into most of his fights with the protection of the referees, uh, and in some cases the judges, but for the most part the referees. In this case, he did need the judges. The referees allow him to get away with indiscretions. They allow him to headbutt, you know, sometimes throw low blows. A lot of the times throw rabbit punches when he has opponents in the clinch and he's able to push them down with his lead hand. He does oftentimes throw very blatant rabbit punches and he did so near the end of the 12th round on Franklin. Yeah, uh... Not a great day of boxing in Britain. I enjoyed the Gorman versus Wardley fight to an extent. Um, I didn't really enjoy Pat McCormick's performance. Uh, Mark Dickinson, he fought the same dude uh, that gave Hebert Cons made Hebert Consis out kind of not look the best on the Edwards versus uh, Alvarado undercard. But yeah, just not a really good day of boxing in Britain. I enjoyed the Franklin versus White fight, but I felt the wrong guy got the decision. I felt Franklin deserved it, you know. Luckily for him, of course, like I, as I previously stated, he's going to get another big opportunity because of the fact, you know, that he did put up a good showing in what was supposed to be a showcase fight for White. And, I mean, I suppose heavyweight can't really get enough of, you know, gatekeepers as the division is starting to thin out, <clears throat> you know, in terms of contenders and with a lot of the guys starting to decline like a Parker or a White. So, yeah, just, just, uh... Really just kind of a putrid day of boxing in Britain. I hope Regis versus Cepeda is better, but... Yeah, I don't... Bakradir Jalilov's returning tonight, too, against the guy who walked out of the ring and... Against F.A. Jogba. So, yeah, I'm just... I'm disappointed.